This episode of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast is brought to you by M.G. Schlachter, a built environment and architectural consulting firm with an in-house production team. Delivering support services in the retail, hospitality, and residential sectors for leading brands worldwide, M.G. Schlachter is reinventing, something near and dear to my heart, of course, architectural support services. So look, let's say you're a worldwide fashion retailer and your new business plan calls for opening 450 new stores around the world this year. Or say you're an architecture firm and in order to grow, you need to staff up quickly to produce detailed drawing packages for your new winning project. Or dig this, let's say you're a national hospitality brand who's putting together a new line of boutique hotels and you've got to produce a massive amount of graphics, such as custom artwork, posters, or slide decks, both in digital and print. M.G. Schlachter serves architecture and interior design firms, retailers, construction companies, graphic designers, and brand managers. And with the way they're reinventing architectural support services, they offer production and strategic consulting. Their in-house production team understands the importance of accuracy and precision and can demonstrate the utmost care throughout the drawing and delivery process. And on the consulting side, their team consists of architects and international design consultants with many years of experience in design and construction. Suffice it to say that whatever built environment or architectural project you're working on, M.G. Schlachter can step in and help accelerate your growth. So, if you're looking for a built environment and architectural services firm with an in-house production team to help you reinvent your next project, check out M.G. Schlachter. Find them on the web at mgschlachter.com. That's M-G-S-H-L-A-C-H-T-E-R.com, mgschlachter.com. Hey gang, I'm excited to bring you this week's episode with Fiona Kespi, where we're exploring how, as a single mom with two young children, she was able to move from her home country of Australia to Cebu in the Philippines to become the CEO of Govier, a virtual assistant company. She's got such a great story. She's been rocking it in Cebu. The company is growing, and now her brother and his family is moving from Australia to Cebu to support the business. Uh, as they enter and look to you know expand to newer markets like the United States versus her home country of Australia, can't wait for you guys to listen to it. Uh, before but before we get there, real quick, I just wanted to uh, remind people that uh, know about it or turn people new people onto uh, this new conference if they haven't heard about it. It's a blockchain conference that I'll be at next week in Cleveland, Ohio. It's December I think seventh to no December 9th to the eleventh. It's called the Blockchain Solutions Conference. And it's a cool thing. I went to it last year, and it's it's sort of the flavor of this particular one. It's kind of a crossroads between uh, the corporate world, blockchain, and cryptocurrency. So, you know, a lot of the crypto blockchain conferences out there are, you know, cryptocurrency focused or more speculative. It's sort of that crypto crowd. But this one is kind of a crossroads of the corporate world and blockchain and what the real applications are. So... Um, it's more, more of a real, war, real world take on it that's trying to find the real value for the underlying technology. So there's the big people there. Let, I'll just read you a couple of the speakers that'll be there. So guys like uh, Thomas Curian, who's the CEO of Google Cloud, uh, Don Tapscott, who's the co-founder and executive chairman of the Blockchain Research Institute out of Toronto, Canada, uh, Simon Mulcahy, executive VP and chief innovation officer for Salesforce. Um, so, you know, those type of guys, really, they're, this is one of the, to me, the best conferences, I think, around the world in terms of what's really going to move the needle with blockchain technology. So, super excited to be there again this week. I'll be hanging out um, at the Hilton downtown where the conference is based out of, or the conference center that's connected to the Hilton. So, if anyone is out there that's going to be in town for it, wants to connect and hang, you can hit me up on Twitter at Jimium Group. So, at J-I-M-I-U-M-G-R-O-U-P on Twitter. Hit me up there. Also, now that I'm thinking about it, a little shout out to uh, Trevor Wright from MileMethod.com. So he helped me book my rooms at the Hilton uh, downtown. So thanks, Trevor. I'll give you a little shout out there. So if you're into saving points and miles and want to book like five-star travel for almost no dollars, check out MileMethod.com. Um, just had a chance to uh, catch up with Trevor and hang while we were in Cancun uh, just a few weeks ago. So, thanks, bud. Uh, okay. All right. So, once again, I will see you at the Blockland Solutions Conference, the Blockchain Conference in Cleveland, Ohio, coming up here December 9th to the 11th. 
If you haven't checked it out yet, go to blocklandsolutions.com and check it out, and I will see you there. All right, so let's get to this week's episode with Fiona. Welcome to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast, the show that explores reinvention in the digital age as it relates to career, creativity, and technology. Stay tuned for interviews with professionals, entrepreneurs, and creatives that have reimagined success and are making a pivot. If you'd like to listen to the entire back catalog, visit JimJim'sReinventionRevolution.com for instant access. And now, here's your host, Jim Jim. All right. Hey, everybody. Hey, this is Jim Jim. Welcome to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast, episode number 60. And I'm talking today with Fiona Kespi, and we're talking virtual assistance and offshoring in the Philippines. So, Fiona, welcome to the Reinvention Revolution. Thanks, Jim. I'm really excited uh, to be speaking to you today. Well, I can't wait to dig into this with you because... Well, I should mention, first of all, before we get started here, that you are the, the CEO and head of culture, as I see, of Go VA or Go Virtual Assistance. Um, you'll tell me your official name here in a second. But the reason I mention that is I was looking at, um, I think it was my LinkedIn today, which was during the day, my day. It's like in the evening now while I'm talking to you. I know it's a different day over for you. So maybe it was yesterday for you when you posted this, but it was on your LinkedIn. And I saw a picture of your team out there and it looked like you were celebrating a a milestone of maybe like an, a, a, that you hit an employment number or I'm not sure what it was because I can't figure out how to bring that post back up in LinkedIn. It's like the one through the feed. And I know you have one of your business goals, uh, which I saw out there that's out there is to create a thousand jobs locally and help a hundred businesses to scale. So I know you were celebrating something. So tell me again what you were celebrating. Yes, yeah, so we were celebrating 400 team members. Our goal, you're right, our goal is 1,000 by September 2020. Oh, How wow. good does it okay. sound? It sounds really good, 2020, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> and that celebration, that photo was at our monthly culture lunch, and that's our lunch with the CEO, which mm-hmm. is me. Okay. And that's a 40, it's about a 45-minute presentation. We actually bring lunch in for everyone, so we feed everyone on the day. That's a production in itself. And we have we start with this amazing video, which is a recap of the month that we've just had, where we've taken videos of it could be you know a client visit, uh, the monthly celebration that we take everyone out to as well. Uh, there's welcoming new team members that are on that video, and then we're handing out. Uh, values awards to team members mm-hmm. to say thank you there, sharing the updates um, as well with the team personally from myself on our journey to a thousand. And I also share it will either be a, a culture tip or a productivity uh, tip or hack, something that can help them not only in work but in life in general. As well, so I'm a big fan of, you know, Robin Sharma, the leader without a title, mm-hmm. uh, Simon Sinek, right. uh, his work, Mel Robbins, uh, Vishan, who has written the Code of the Extraordinary Mind. So you know, taking the the best of the best, the learnings that I do, and sharing that with the team to inspire them as well. Wow. Well, I think it's pretty awesome. And it was just something that I noticed that kind of struck a chord with me really for two ways. Cause it, you know, I was looking at you're like, Oh, head of culture. That's interesting. Um, obviously I think, you know, defining the culture for a business, especially when it's your own, it's a, it's a startup, it's a new thing. It's really hard to, you know, recruit. I think if you don't have a strong vision and culture for your teams that you're building. Um, but also it kind of struck me in that the Philippines is a very interesting culture. You know, it's kind of fun and, um, you know, relaxed, but but they work super hard there. And I, I wanted to ask you about, do you kind of view it two different ways? Because, you know, I, was there, I, was, I visited the Philippines for the first time earlier this year in March before I, before I knew you. Fortunately, we didn't get a chance to meet when I was over there. But I, I really... Next trip. Yeah, yeah, next trip for sure, exactly. <laughs> uh, but I was really <laughs> struck by um, how fun it is there, how friendly everybody is, and how nice everybody is. Do you kind of is is this does this sort of demand kind of these types of things there more so like I don't think you would have this type of culture as much here like in the states for example at least I haven't experienced it you know 
Yeah, that's true. Look, I, th I think it's a couple of things. Uh, yes, they do embrace more of these activities. I think also in the Philippines, we can afford to do more things. Mm, so often when I okay. speak to new clients when they come on board and I say, hey, these are all the activities that we do to create the culture. And nine times out of ten, a client will go, oh, I'd love to do that, but I just can't. We don't have the budget. Right. Or... I'm not in a position that I can get approval to implement as well. So the advantage is that I can make those changes and implement them. And then the it is cost effective that we can, you know, for example, we can take everyone out for a meal and it only costs between five to eight dollars. Right. Now, you can't do that in the US. You can't do that in Australia. No. Uh, so that's you know that that is quite favorable and quite helpful uh, as I see. well. Yeah, well, that helps put it in context. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, because I see I've, I'm kind of getting to know the region over there, Southeast Asia, spending some time in Thailand, different places, and now the Philippines, where you know, and maybe because it's more sun and fun and, <laughs> and the beach is close. Yeah. But you know, you go yeah. and we hang out in these in these different ways, which is is a lot more fun and creates really great working teams. And you know, when you're talking about um, Virtual teams, you know, especially if you're someone from the United States or Australia that may, might be outsourcing or interested in that kind of stuff, I'm sure it's a question on your, you know, clients' minds or people out there are thinking, you know, how could I, how easy it is, is it really to outsource things or to have a big team that's remote? You know, you're probably thinking like it's going to be a struggle to uh, be able to work with them. Um, so that's kind of just a cool cultural thing that I think is a little bit different. So just something I was uh, interested in discussing there. But before we go any further, let me hear a little bit more about exactly what you do, because I think like this term virtual assistant, okay, I, I kind of stumbled upon it, gosh, probably, I don't know, five or six years ago, kind of started becoming a little more prominent, I think. And, mm. uh, you know, beforehand, I, you know, when I got out of school, I might have an engineering and manufacturing background and advanced technology guy. And, you know, outsourcing, the concept of outsourcing has been out there for a long time. Everybody has remote facilities, especially when you're working in a big corporate atmosphere. You know, you have a team in Tulsa, Oklahoma and in St. Louis. I mean, everybody kind of understands you have to work remote in some ways. Uh, but that was kind of looked at as outsourcing. You're going to outsource it to China or whatever. But the virtual assistant thing is a little bit different of a nuance, I think. And what's really interesting, I think, about the Philippines in particular is that there's really back office or, you know, largely larger operations of larger companies that are completely being outsourced there. And and so that's what I think this part of your business. But please explain what your business is and why you call it virtual assistance. Uh, yeah, so I think I think the word virtual assistant, it, it originally meant, you know, someone working from home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've, we've embraced uh, virtual assistant as virtual, meaning that, you know, you're meeting with that person online to do the, the training and to QA their work and to give instructions and, and to do your to do your meetings. Mm -hmm. And that the the team, either that person or the team that you're building is assisting your team in your home country. Uh, I think sometimes there can be a negativity to outsourcing with a view that, you know, some really big corporations have gone and cut teams of people right. and then hired them um, somewhere in, you know, the Philippines or, or India. And we're not about that. We're consulting to our clients who are at a growth stage where they know they need some more help to scale up, but it's it's cost prohibitive. Like they can't afford it. If they bring on that next full time person, you know they're going to be losing money. Right. And so what we're consulting to them and saying, you know, add a team member in the Philippines and take away some of those repetitive tasks, so that your team members onshore can spend more time client-facing or more time in strategic work that has that direct impact to grow and scale your business. And we've got lots of really great case studies where our clients have done that and the impact has meant that their business is growing and then they're creating more jobs in their home country, so more jobs in the US or more jobs uh, in Australia, which is a great win-win. Right, right. Well, it's certainly yeah. more flexible and I think the 
you know, the way the world is spinning these days with the, you know, the sharing economy with, you know, the Ubers and the Airbnbs and the, you know, we work for co-working, it, it just makes mm. sense to have more of a flexible workforce, I think. Yes. And yes. right. Using, you know, a, a VA or the concept of VAs in this way where it's like, hey, at a lower risk, uh, I think, you know, way to, to explore and experiment when, you know, your business might be changing so rapidly that you're like, you know what, I think we need to do this. I'm not, I'm not ready to go all in on it, but I want to experiment like right now, you know, I think it could be a good idea. And maybe that's how someone gets, yeah. someone gets started, right? Because it's flexible. Yes, yeah, it's it, it's that's a really great point because you could be a a solo entrepreneur working from home, mm-hmm. and you're not ready to commit to an office space. Right. Um, or we've got you know larger clients that have completely outgrown their space. There is no more room to hire someone. Right. However, the cost to then go and lease another space and do a fit out, not knowing whether you know will those extra team members make a difference, it, it is high risk and having a virtual assistant like you said means that they can trial that out and work out okay is is that project going to work or is that new position or positions what's going to really scale the business right right yeah i think you know outsourcing was more kind of about efficiency and cutting costs i think conceptually like why the bigger businesses started it but i think this kind of virtual assistant Mm. you know concept is really like you said it's more about flexibility uh, enabling growth, um, you know, trying different things. I think it makes uh, total sense, especially with, gosh, the way people are moving around the world these days and, and and how the cultures are changing and the communications are changing around the world. There's all these new technologies, obviously, we can use. Like, you're, you know, sitting in Cebu right now, 12 hours away from me and uh, having this, you know, crystal clear conversation. It's pretty, pretty cool. It is, isn't it? I think, I, I think I compare to... Uh, being in business, you know, 10 years ago and it was so much harder and so much more cost, uh, so much more expensive mm-hmm, um, right. to compared to what it is uh, today into setting up a business and scaling a business. And I should also say as well with uh, assistance, often it's thought of as just administration. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're actually helping clients across a broad cross section of skills. So whatever the client needs them, assist their team on shore, then we're going to market skills. So it's not just admin and customer service and sales, which is traditionally what people think about. Right. You know, it's graphic design, it's bookkeeping, IT support, development, even construction and engineering, like architectural drafters, estimators, mm-hmm. um, social media and marketing is a big one with you know video editing, podcast editing. Right. Uh, content writing, uh, social media uh, administration and project coordinating. It is really um, whatever you can think about, you can actually find those skills in the Philippines. I see. Well, you know, I'm glad you mentioned all that because that was one of my next questions was like, what, yeah. what's the breadth and depth, you know, kind of where do you go or uh, how do you how do you look at it for your particular offerings that you offer? Well, one other question along the lines of that is, What's the scale factor? Like you said, you you talked about maybe an individual entrepreneur. Like, you know, if I wanted to come to you, could I hire just one person? Or does it need to be a team of a certain scale? Like, you know, what kind of niches scale, you know, scale-wise do you serve? Yeah, so we help everyone from uh, individual entrepreneurs right through to uh, publicly listed companies on stock exchanges and mm-hmm. some well-known brands. And yes, you can start with just one. And even with some of our larger clients, I'm often recommending just start with one mm-hmm. and get your processes right and see if it is the right fit for you. And then once you've got that right, then scale up and add additional people. I see. I, you know what? I really like that idea. That's to me, that's the right way to kind of go about any projects or starting a relationship where you need to get to know someone and let's figure out if it's really going to work before you're diving in. Right. Yes. Yeah. And so we've, you know, we've got some competitors in the marketplace that there is a minimum, there might be a minimum of five or a minimum of uh, 20, Mm -hmm. but I really believe you should just have the opportunity to test it out see if it's the right fit, see if you're ready to get started. Right. Well, I 100% agree, and that makes me want to want to 
check you out already <laughs> because you're, you're oh, like, there's good. no pressure. There's the no pressure, right? Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's no, no pressure. pressure. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's like if I'm thinking about it. Yeah, and we do. It's it's only um it's only a minimum three month contract, mm -hmm. and then after that it just rolls on month to month. Cancel any time with thirty days. So yeah, we're not yeah. even locking into long term contracts. Uh, we believe in the theory of abundance, and you know if you do a good job and there's a good relationship, you don't you don't need those long term locking contracts. That's you know, right. If it's not working, totally you don't agree. want to tie someone in. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. I totally agree. And you know, I, yeah, here's my. I totally agree. You're on the right track. <laughs> here's the reality <laughs> of of I, I've been in this other world of you know supply contracts and all, supplier agreements and all this kind of stuff, and it's there three years and five years. And and the reality is when the economy changes, those agreements agreements don't mean anything. I couldn't agree with you know why? Because if the guy, if the, yeah. the business doesn't, doesn't have cash to pay you, the agreement doesn't matter. There is no contract yet. <laughs> there is no yeah. contract. And <laughs> you know. I I also do this with uh, our team members as well. Mm -hmm. So you know there can be. I've seen other employment contracts out there where the on the employment contract it will say you know you can't go and work for a competitor. Yeah. Now we all know that that's a lengthy process in a court that never holds up anyway. No right. judge is ever going to stop someone from, you know, having a job. Right. And so right from the beginning, my focus was like, okay, you can do two things. You can focus on um, contracts and legalities and, and being really heavy handed and trying to enforce that. Right. Or you can put that energy into focusing on culture and relationships, which then attracts more people and people want to stay. Right. And that's where the, the that's, I think, that that's the most important thing to, to focus on uh, rather than that contractual side. Right. Love it. Well, I, I'm, I'm starting to get the picture here why you're the head of culture, Fiona. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, something I'm very passionate yeah, about. Yeah, I, I love it. Well, yeah. I love it. You're yeah. speaking. You're speaking my lang my same language. So, see, I knew our friend, our friend Aya. You know, she she recommended that I get in touch with you, and she's a spot. She's my sponsor of the podcast, by the way. So from Aya from MG Schlachter, I can figure out yes. throw her name in here a little bit, uh, just because she's yeah, the connection for us. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So cool. I just want to say thank you, Aya, for connecting me with Fiona. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah. Um, thank you, Aya. She's yeah. a massive inspiration. Oh, I, uh, she's so cool. I actually wish. Yeah, I wish she had more time in Cebu. I'm looking forward to her next trip. Yeah, I know. Well, we were talking because, you know, I've been going to, to Asia. It, usually when the weather gets colder here, I'm thinking like, you know what? I need to go to Asia. <laughs> it's, it's warm over there. Yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so we're talking about, yeah, when she's going to be there and when I might be there again. So maybe we'll be able to connect. It'd be great to meet you in person at some point. Um, That'd be good. I like the sound of that. Yeah. And, well, you know, I... Another reason why I wanted to talk, to, why I was interested in talking to you, getting to know you, was because you're from originally from Australia. If anybody out there couldn't figure that out yet, um, but <laughs> by your voice, by your accent, uh, and I was in Australia earlier this year because I have cousins that are that live in Adelaide, and so oh, nice. I, yeah, so I went to visit them, and I was in Sydney for a couple of days. Uh, but you know, this this leads us to to really uh, one of the cool parts of your story, and that is. How you ended up in Cebu? You're originally from Australia, and how you Australia. ended up, yeah, you, how you ended up creating this business in the first place? Because you know, obviously, when you first got out of school, whatever you were doing, other things, this business hasn't been around that long, and now you're really slamming it. You've got, you've already got 400 employees, uh, you know, working with, with all these businesses. So, how do you go from Australia and it, end up in the Philippines? To the Philippines. Yeah. I know. Do you know what? I love this. It's a great story. And if you had have said to me six years ago, you're going to be running a business in the Philippines, I would have thought you were crazy. Right. And <laughs> yeah. So I have been, over the years, I've been in uh, family businesses and in business with my brother. So, mm -hmm. which is very fortunate. We have this, um, an amazing relationship to work together. Uh, we do have the last uh, surname. So whenever I have a meeting, I have to get in really quick and say, hey, it's my brother, not my husband, because no one really wants their brother referred oh, to as their husband. Right. Yeah. <laughs> good point. Smooth. All right. That's good. You get in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You got to get in, got to get in quick. Right. And we had a, many years ago, oh, around 2007, 2008, we had a software development company and we were using... Okay, when uh, you say, hold on a second, when you say we, you mean you and your brother already were working together? We were already working together. Okay. We had a software development company. Okay, so let me let me ask you, sorry, let me ask you right yes. here. How did you get started working with your brother, and what is that like? Because I, I don't think that would work for a lot of families necessarily. Some families, obviously it does. How, do you, how, do you, how did you think about it, or how did you end up working together? 
We so we were brought up with parents who worked together in small business. Mm -hmm. So I suppose in some ways it was just normal family working together. I see. Okay. And we, I, I went off and worked in recruitment. I fell into recruitment. Mm -hmm. uh, he had another business. Uh, he needed some help with recruitment. I was like happy to help out because it's something I was passionate with. And we, you know, and that's that's how that sort of first relationship started. I think for two things is we have the same value set. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, it's probably three things. The second thing is uh, we have different areas of the business that we work in and are responsible for. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we always, you know, we meet on a very regular basis. And actually, I've just convinced uh, he and his wife to relocate to Cebu and they actually really? uh, arrived here two days ago. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's no part way. of the story. As oh, well. yeah, yeah. I did not know and, that. Okay. Um. And we make decisions together, you know. So if there's a big decision uh, at Govier, mm -hmm. you know, I will always uh, include him in that, you know, out of out of respect because sure. he was the the founder of Govier. I yeah. gotcha. Okay. All right. Yeah. So so it was more of a natural thing. Uh, you start working together. You said you you had you'd already had some kind of other software development company, I guess. So you kind of knew. Yeah, we had we're a software development technology savvy, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. So I, I had a background in IT recruitment. Um, Matt's always had uh, a real interest in technology, done a lot of self-study. We were using uh, Upwork, um, right. which back then was Odesk, and we were using uh, resources in India and Pakistan. And okay, for your, own, for your own development, For right? your own software development right. company okay. back in 2000, and uh -huh. around the... 2007, 2008. Gotcha. And we had some really great experiences, mm -hmm. but we also had some really bad experiences. So, I whatever see. could go wrong, we experienced that. Mm -hmm. So, everything from, you know, code being stolen to oh, wow. uh, people disappearing or asking for more money. And right. so, all those things that, that can go wrong, delays in deadlines. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway... Uh, after after that business, a few years down the track, Matt went and uh, sourced a, a virtual assistant um, for himself and the, a few other people were asking for a virtual assistant from him and mm -hmm. he reached out to me and said, hey, I think there's I've, – I've got this idea for a business. I, I think it's got legs. I see. And I'd like to be able to, you know, take all our learnings and help – um, businesses with uh, teams in the Philippines because he had a Filipino um, VA at that time. I see. Okay. And I was um, at the time I was working in recruitment. I had a fabulous boss. It was a great company, but I had a lot of personal challenges with my kids, mm. and I needed to work part time. I and see. he said, "Do you want to come into the business with me?" And I said, "Yes." I said, "I would love to do sales and work part time from home." Mm -hmm. he said, Said, done deal. Wow, so I was very right. excited. Yeah, I was very <laughs> was excited easy. about that. It was uh -huh. easy. Yeah. I was very excited about that. Uh, he said to me, oh, we're not finding the right applicants. And I said, oh, okay, let me have a look at how your HR team in the Philippines are doing mm -hmm. the recruitment process. You know, can I, I'll help out with that. And then he said, would you like to come to Cebu for a week so you can see the office? And I said, that's a great idea because... Okay. I need to experience it if I'm selling it. Now, at this and time, you got, you guys were both still in where? where Brisbane, Australia? in Australia, in Brisbane, in Brisbane, yeah, okay. in Brisbane Australia. Uh, so you're still both there, but he was traveling back and forth to you know yeah, obviously to manage do, things, right? Yeah, he would do one week every month I uh, okay. in Cebu. Gotcha. And, and he's a really good salesman, really good. Mm -hmm. So the first night we arrived, we're at the Moven Pick on Mactown Island, a beautiful five-star hotel, this beautiful view. Yeah, nice. And yes, yeah. And then we're staying at the Radisson, another beautiful hotel in the city. And you know, can imagine there's the harp music playing at nighttime, having a lovely cocktail. And he said, hey, one of us needs to move to the Philippines to scale this business. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I said, I completely agree. I said, when are you moving? He said, no, I can't. My <laughs> wife won't let me. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and I, I sort of looked behind me and I went, are you looking at me? And he said, yes. And I'm a single mum. Oh. So I said, I can't. I said, I can't. You just pick your like, kids up and do that, right? I know. And I did the whole, I'm a single mum. I can't do that. 
Anyway, on the plane on the way back, I started thinking about it and I thought, why can't I do that? You know, why can't I, you know, reinvent my life, do right. something really different and show my daughters that anything's possible oh, if I you put that. your mind to it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And look, I grew I grew up uh with a mum who loved to travel. Mm -hmm. So every every once a year or once every two years we went overseas. So, and I'd spent three months backpacking through South Southeast Asia in my late twenties. Mm, I'd spent okay. in my early twenties I'd spent two years in London. So the thought of relocating to another country, I'd lived in Sydney in Australia, not just Brisbane. Mm -hmm. So relocating somewhere new wasn't foreign to me. I see. Okay. So I knew that I knew that there would be challenges because it's different, but I also thought, hey, this could be a great adventure. Right. And I also thought for my children going to international school, it makes them more open-minded, makes them think as global citizens. Oh, yeah. So I thought, what's, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen? We could come over here and hate it, right. and then we just go back to Australia. That's right, yeah. And go back to our old lives. Or it could be this amazing adventure and, um, it, you know, is, is the foundation for them for being really great human beings and, and adults. Right. And so I said to him, yeah, and, and international school, you know, have friends around the world. And so I said to Matt, I was like, yeah, okay, I'll do this. I said, I'll do it for two years. And then after two years, I'll go back to Australia. They can finish off high school in Australia and then you can um, come over and do the next two years. And uh, once my kids have finished high school, I'll come back again. And he was like, yep, that's great. All right. Anyway. Yeah, I was just going to ask you how, how old they were when you decided to move. They were the right age. They were 11 and 12. 11 and so 12. They okay, were, so they were a little bit more on their own at that point, yeah. Not like yeah, little three and five or something would be tougher probably. No, that'd be tougher. And I actually brought them over for three weeks okay. to say, hey, this is where we could potentially be living. This is where you could be going for school. Right. Would you be open to this? And they said yes because I didn't want them to have a, a culture shock. And I think also at that age, if they were halfway through high school, it'd be too difficult to, right, um, right. to make that change. Yep. Anyway, 12 months in, I thought, I really like the lifestyle here and I love what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to stay. And they said, yep, we're happy to stay. We're enjoying school here. We we love our Filipino friends. And I said to Matt, I'd like to stay. And he said, that's really good because I can't convince my wife to move yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> four years. So, it worked out, I guess. <laughs> it worked out, yeah. And yeah. looking within that 12-month period as well, uh, I was heading up uh, sales and recruitment and really focusing on the, the culture piece because mm -hmm. from a recruitment point of view, it's all about you need to attract the best talent sure, um, yeah. and then you've got to sell to them why they need to be here. But then what you're... Uh, the, what you're attracting and selling to them, you, you've really got to be walking the talk so mm -hmm. that they're engaged and that they stay right, um, right. as well. And then so Matt said to me, uh, there's this other business that I'd like us to invest in. That was in um, payments automation. Uh, would you like to be the CEO? And I said, well, guess what? I said, I think I'm actually doing everything, so I may as well have the title. So we had a bit of a laugh <laughs> already, over that. <laughs> already the CEO, right. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> We're kind of already doing it. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, so I, I took on that role then um, officially. I see. Okay. And, and look, here's, here's something really um, – oh, and then, yeah, and then I have – we have convinced – uh, Lisa, my sister-in-law, to relocate. So they've got two small kids. So they're here now, So, mm. uh, which is really good. And we've got an older sister uh, who works in sales uh, for us as well. So it is a really family-oriented uh, business. And the great thing, I think something I'm really proud about is that we really, we haven't spent any money on Google AdWords. Mm. We haven't okay. had any aggressive outbound sales campaigns. Mm -hmm. It has all been organic growth because right from the beginning, um, myself and the management team, our focus has been on getting the culture right. I see. And when you look after your team and you select the right people, then you look after them and they do a great job, our clients then had the confidence to create more positions right. um, in the Philippines, expand their teams, and then tell their friends and colleagues as well. Right. And so that's, that's where all our growth has come from is focusing on the team members. Awesome. Yeah, there's nothing more powerful than word of mouth. You know, when someone says, hey, you got to use these guys. They're awesome, you know. Yeah, because it's yeah. a real trust play. It's, yeah. you know, you've got to, you're trusting someone else to 
partner with you to take care of uh, their business. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that I committed to actually relocating and be here on the Philippines has th that's where the, a lot of our clients have got that trust from they're like hey th this is really great we right. love the fact that you're on, right. you're on the ground there. yeah you're not man you know. trying to manage it from afar and whatever you're really there every day so yeah that's cool neat so let me let me ask you a question uh when you decided to move there were there issues with um you know visas and work permits and all that kind of stuff you know how was it a challenge to move to the philippines to open a business and do that kind of thing or how did you navigate uh, look, it? Look, it's it's a challenge moving to any country, and it's a challenge <laughs> setting up a business. <laughs> right. Right. No, interesting enough, visas are really easy. You could come okay. in on a, a a tourist visa, and then apply for um, your work visa here. So, I see. Okay. It, look, the pro look the process was um, a bit challenging just because there's a lot of bureaucracy mm -hmm. um, within the government here, but it's not difficult like Australia where there's, you know, in, in, in the US as well where there's a, you know, there's a selection criteria right. to be able to get a visa. Um, that wasn't the case here. I so gotcha. I, was, yeah, I felt very fortunate. Yeah, that, well, that's what I thought. I mean, some of these places, I mean, that's part of, you know, uh, I guess shining some light on this, you know, in terms of opportunities that, you know, there's other places in the world that are ready to grow now that we're connected with the internet and social media and all these technologies. You know, it's really opportunity, real, there are real opportunities for people to kind of move around and create businesses different places. And I think it's a win-win, you know, for everybody. You know, you bring your, oh, your, your background expertise of how to run businesses. You bring the, you know, the connections that you have in Australia and then, you know, create jobs, like you said, locally. It's pretty, pretty a nice story, you know. So, okay, so you're, now you said your brother's moving there. So this is just a breaking news or something, latest development? Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes, the latest development. Uh, he was actually going to come earlier in April. However, there was an outbreak of measles. Oh, wow. And he's got <laughs> a, a brand new baby mm -hmm. uh, who immunizations happens at nine months in Australia. So they wanted her to be fully immunized before yeah. coming over yeah, yeah. Um, to the Philippines, which was the, you know, the right thing to do. So they're here now, so which is really exciting. So this uh, is going to be really instrumental in the next uh, scale up. Uh, Matt's background, also he worked for Franklin Covey. Oh, okay. um, from the US mm -hmm. and headed up their execution practice in Australia and um, New Zealand. So teaching the four disciplines of execution, seven habits of highly effective people, you know, changing that human behavior in large corporations. Mm -hmm. And that's been a big foundation um, for us, uh, the work of uh, Stephen Covey as well. So I, I see. It's, yeah. Right. Okay. You're rocking the culture piece over there. That's cool. <laughs> uh, nice. Thank you. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Well, you know, we got a few minutes, um, uh, but before we get out of here, there's always a, a few questions I, that I like to ask people that come on the show. And, and one is about the technology piece. So now, you know, you, you decided to create this. There's these systems in place now where it's easier to f connect with people around the world, connect with, you know, the mm -hmm. corporations that are looking for, for people. How are you thinking about technology and what are the, um, maybe you can share with us a couple of the maybe technology platforms that you use in terms of connecting people. I know there's these things out there like, um, you know, Slack these days and smart sheets and there's all these different programs, you know, Trello and all these kinds of things. Is there, do you have like a custom piece or how do you think about the technology part in, team, in terms of tr always Great trying question. to grab, you know, yeah. wrap your head around this is the right tool to use and it's changing this way. And, you know, what do you think about that part? Yeah, it's, it, look, this is a really important question because it, it also leads into the fact that, you know, automation, there's going to be massive changes with um, jobs through automation. That's right. And we really need to be at the forefront of that as well. Mm -hmm. um, we love technology. We have our own in-house uh, development teams uh, as well. Uh, yes, there's lots of great products out there, you know, like, you know, Skype for Business, which right. um, we're using at the moment, and um, Zoom.us, you know, mm -hmm. where clients and team members can meet online, they can share their screens, they can record the session, it can be broken down to training videos. Uh, yes, Slack, we're a big fan of Slack for communication um, as well, and there's all the project management um, boards, like Trello, I use that myself, big fan. Mm -hmm. That's just really simple and easy. I love it. And then we're also um, developing software in-house. We've got a uh, 
piece of technology called do this dot to to mm, okay. and we're currently using it ourselves and um, very soon it will be for all our clients to use and then actually anyone in any business to use as well and it's a really cool piece of software uh, it's white labeled you can log in you have your own branding on it you create your organizational chart of all the different positions the photo of your team member um, your team member can then click on their profile um, up pops all the tasks that they do. Mm -hmm. So not the job descriptions, but their task. So you can do, you know, brain dump of all the tasks that they do. I see, yeah. Click on a click on a task, then up pops the standard operating procedure on how to do that task. I see. They can okay. then watch a they can then watch the video. So like with what we just spoke about, how you can, you know, mm -hmm. you can create that video um, just by using uh, zoom.us or, or use Loom. That's another great one for creating um, videos. They can watch the video. Then they can answer a couple of questions. So you can then, then actually automate the full onboarding and training of your team member, mm -hmm. um, which makes that the, the scaling faster. It also means that, there's a reference point for them to go back to um, with a guide on, you know, how to do those activities. Um, and more importantly, everything's saved in the, the correct place. Right. Uh, I know we have a challenge, and most business owners you'll talk to, it's like, oh, yeah, a document gets updated, but someone doesn't store it in the right file online, and then you can't find it or it's stored on someone's um, computer. So nothing's ever Nothing's ever lost. Right. Uh, there will be a second and third iteration to that software. So the second iteration will be uh, like workflow management mm -hmm. so that you can actually see where the team are up to when in different parts of a, a process, you know, and have approval and QA processes as well. And then the, the third iteration will be... Um, uh, Judy, so you can ask Judy. Judy, hey oh, okay. Judy, hey. yeah, it's going to be Judy. <laughs> okay. Hey Judy, can you tell me who I need to speak to to get business cards? So, if you ever wa worked in a larger corporation and you know how much time gets wasted when it's oh, who do I go to for this? Oh, who That's do right. I go for that? Right. And next thing you know, three or four people have been involved in answering a question mm -hmm. where it's not needed. We can all the information's in that system. We can use the artificial intelligence that you can, you know, just like you speak to um, to Siri, uh, you can then ask Judy, "Hey, who do I who do I go to for this particular uh, activity?" Uh, so that's one um, that's one piece of software. We're also developing in a house our own um, recruitment and billing as well, um, which is unique for the outsourcing industry. And that too, once that's finished. Um, we will then release that to the industry as well so that other smaller um, virtual assistant businesses uh, can use it as well. I see. Wow, cool. Well, I, I like these um, custom in-house in solutions. That's pretty neat. Uh, it, you know, it reminds me, you know, I've been in the, you know, advanced technology world doing, you know, developing new things in the engineering world. And it, it makes complete sense to me in terms of, you know, if I'm creating a new product, I got to create the actual process that goes with it because you have to design the product and process at the same time and then do the work instructions and all this kind of stuff. In the manufacturing world, this makes complete sense. And I've always, I was always curious about all these other parts of the company or parts of the world that were never quite automated and structured and, you know, where you could find the documents. <laughs> didn't quite work as well in the other, uh, you know, sort of parts because you were focused on the, making the manufacturing work, right? You know, with parts per million yes, quality yeah. and all this kind of stuff. I think all this stuff it's, now is coming to all these different areas and be being pushed online and as you, as you mentioned being pushed out really to mobile applications too, right? So like if you're an individual, mm. you might be looking at your phone for your daily tasks when you walk in in the morning, right? Cuz you have a little screen there for yourself is that what you were describing? Yes, yeah. And yeah. oh, and the other thing is that there is uh, we're doing a bit in app technology as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So we actually have a, a gratitude app so a team can actually send messages of gratitude to their clients to oh. say thank you for okay. a, a celebration. And also <laughs> like um, for the do this dot two software, uh, we've got an app called read this, which connects to it. So for example, if you are a, a salesperson and you've just had it walked out from a meeting, uh, you can actually call up a template from the app, 
mm-hmm. which has all the you know the the headings or subject headings of the information that you need to get to your sales administration VA mm-hmm. um, and so it's a prompt so you you speak into the app and it records all the information send it off to and then it automatically then sends it off to the virtual assistant mm-hmm. but then they go and update the CRM and do the next steps as well so nothing's lost from that meeting to when you get back to the office. I see. Wow, really interesting. Well, cool. Well, I love I love this sort of mix of of culture and technology. So th- those are the things that I I like I like to uh, learn about and hang out in the realm of the world I like to hang out in. So cool, yeah. <laughs> like that. Yeah. Well, we believe we believe that it's a people and technology play at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know that that kind of leads into my um, my next question in terms of just the the culture and being kind of forward thinking. As you, as you go along and, and you're trying to figure out how to create these new things, how do you keep your mind open to all these different technologies, the way the world's spinning, and, and keeping you know, the culture at the forefront? Yeah, I think this is a challenge for folks as, as time moves on here, as, as technology is creeping faster and farther into our lives. How do you keep your mind open to the challenge of creating the next thing and seeing the, the path through it all? to keep culture at the center, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. There's there's two things that, that I do. Um, the, the first thing is I have to look after my health. Mm-hmm. You know, being a, being a CEO with 400 team members, mm-hmm. it's almost – You've got to think of yourself as an elite athlete. Now, I'm not an elite athlete. I'm putting that out there. Okay. Uh, but I, I, but you're I elite in some way. I mean, not everyone does <laughs> in this. In some way, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but, you know, I structure my week uh, and taking care of myself just like I structure um, sales calls. So, you know, you book mm-hmm. in a sales call with a new client, you always turn up for that call right. you know you don't make excuses That's so right. it's the same thing in starting my day is always um some exercise um for example and you know eating well and uh well great thing here about the philippines is you, you know you can have a massage for about eight dollars yeah, uh so that. you know so i can have two or three massages a week right. um but i don't think of that as indulgent it is this is all self-care mm-hmm. uh to look after myself um then the second thing is learning so i actually structure into my time that i spend at least 30 to 45 minutes every single day either um uh, reading or listening to audiobooks so that I can keep myself um, up to date as well. And that's where a lot of the ideas come from too. You know, and how good is it that we can, you know, now either listen to a podcast or we can listen to an audiobook or read a book right. based on someone else being successful and, you know, their 10 or 20 years of learning is all in, a, is in one book. Absolutely. And if you're allocating you know 40 minutes every day to reading within the end of one week you've read a book and so that's you know you can then go well it's actually quite easy to read 52 books in a year and all that knowledge um that can come to you as well right so right that's well, something I'm very passionate yeah oh about. oh my god absolutely well the the knowledge plus the the thoughts it stimulates, you know, it's sort of like a, an upward spiral kind of effect of, you know, if you just start learning, yeah. learning and reading and listening to podcasts, all of a sudden your brain is like on fire. Yes, that's what happens to me. It's pretty, pretty interesting, you know. So cool. Oh, it absolutely is. You can get that idea, that idea of something that someone else has done and gone, okay, well, I can take that idea and I'll just put the Govier twist on it or, you know, right. and... And you, yes, and new ideas come to you, and new ways of uh, thinking. And then the, oh, look, the other thing I tell everyone as well is like, be brave. Mm-hmm. Like, don't don't follow the industry standard. Be the industry standard. And even if that's um, so, here's an example. Um, so from a culture piece as well is a lot of our competitors. Um, so in the outsourcing industry, we provide private medical insurance mm. for our employees okay. so it's a bit like the u.s um to go to the hospital see a doctor it's very expensive so you need that that private medical insurance right. and industry standard is that you pay that to your team member once they've passed their probationary period at six months and when i first got here i thought oh why do we have to wait till six months you know the clients are paying for it why not right. give it from day one mm-hmm. and truly take care of 
your team members' health. You know, that's an, a, that's an attraction um, strategy. It's a retention strategy. And it's also just being a really good human being and, yeah. and caring for your team. Why not? Yeah. It's paid but for, I need right? To, so, I needed know. to be... Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, at the time I had... Um, a HR person who said, but no one else does that. And I said, that's okay. Let's be different. Let's <laughs> let's start. <laughs> right, right. As well. Oh, I and, love that and idea so of be the industry standard. You know, don't follow the standards. Be the, the standards. industry standard. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and so interesting enough as well, um, over the last 12 months, I've been questioned uh, about why are you sharing everything that you do on social media? Mm-hmm. So on Facebook and LinkedIn, we'll share, uh, you know, a lot of tips about what we do from a culture point of view. Right. And, you know, why not keep it to yourself to, um, as our, you know, secret strategy? Right. So, but here's my thought. We can't have every outsourcing opportunity out there. That's just not possible. That's right. So why not, why not share it? encourage you know this whole theory of abundance Mm -hmm. encourage other people to improve and do things differently to help their teams and make the industry as a whole um a lot better place right there's opportunity for everybody and you know that's just how you have to look at the world I, i think it's yeah it's a real different change from the i think from the 20th century or the last you know the way the world was when there was just a few channels and mass markets now it's so individualized and so customized. Right. There's just a lot of opportunity for everyone these days. Well, Fiona, I have one more uh, final question for you before we get out of here, and that is, you know, through all your your recent you know changes and this business bubbling up and you moving to Cebu, et cetera, what's what's one reinvestment revelation you can share with everyone of, you know, something that you learned along the way uh, about yourself or maybe about business that you know you wouldn't have imagined, you know, just a, just a few short years ago, you know. Oh, what a wonderful question. Believe in yourself. Your mind is so incredibly powerful that when you believe in yourself and you take the time to learn every day, Mm -hmm. um, not worry about what other people um, say or think about you, you can actually achieve anything that you put your mind to. And I was I was very fortunate enough, um, I think, with the high school that I went to and also my dad who taught, and again, you know, taught me growing up that, you know, you can achieve anything that you put your mind to. Mm-hmm. And that also goes into my other philosophy as well is um, live with no regrets. It's better off to, I, I honestly think that it's better off, you're better off giving something a go and taking that risk. If it fails, you learn from it. Um, if it doesn't fail, then you, you're you successful. And, well, learning is still being successful as well. And then you get to later on in life and you've got no regrets. Right. I mean, you're not at the end of your life going, oh, I wish I had have given that a try. Mm-hmm. Oh, why didn't I do that? Yeah, so yeah. That, that's... Yeah, you're not, that's, li- you're not living in fear or living with limitations, you know. I, I, I think people hear that when people say, oh, you can do anything you put your mind to. It's so, it's so trite in a way, and people have heard it all the yeah. time, until you actually, you know, take this challenge, I guess. Now, people that are listening out there, you know, and experiment with take it. Take it, yeah, live Experiment with, with it. Like, like, try it out. Try that idea out, you know. You've heard it a million times in the story in your head. You're probably saying, oh, but that's not for me, or I'm not sure I could do it, you know. And that's the truth because that's what you're putting your mind towards. <laughs> so, you yeah, know, actually, right? <laughs> yeah, you've got to be really careful what you tell yourself because right. if you tell yourself you can't do it, you can't do it. If right. you do tell yourself you can do it, uh, then then absolutely you can. It's hard. I think that's the other thing is you've got to realize that it is hard work. There's nothing. There's no such thing as um, an overnight success, right. and you need to find your passion. Mm-hmm. What are you passionate about? Because then it's not, then it's not work. It, right. It's, it's your, you know, it's your mission and your vision uh, in life. Right. It's your inspiration. So, well, cool. Well, Fiona, if if people are more interested in um, learning more about Govier or learning more about you, etc., uh, where might you direct and where would you send them? 
Oh, yes. So you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, the great thing about my name, Fiona Kesby, K-E-S-B-Y, is I'm really unique. There's only one of me on LinkedIn. Oh, okay. And there's only one of me on Facebook. Yeah, so I'm really <laughs> right. easy to find. So All right. please um, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, you can also uh, follow me. I have a Fiona Kesby um, business page. You can follow me on Facebook. And but you can also reach out to me through Facebook um uh, as well and yeah i'd love to uh speak to anyone in your audience that is looking at um you know needing outsourcing whether it's a virtual assistant or whether it's a whole team Mm -hmm. Uh, if we're not the right fit uh, then i have this um you know really remarkable network uh here in cebu that can introduce uh to someone else that is the right fit as well ah great idea okay Okay, well, I have all that um, stuff in the show notes, so make sure you go to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution dot com. Check those out there, or find you know the episodes in your favorite uh, podcast app out there. Fiona, thanks again. I really appreciate it, and I'll talk to you soon. Hopefully, I'll see you in Cebu sometime. Ah, oh, Jim, I would love that. Oh, and also one final thing: if yes. anyone mentions um, Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution, then there'd be a five hundred US dollar discount Whoa. off our Kickstarter fee as well. Oh, okay, awesome. Well, I, I really appreciate that. That's some great uh, value for the audience. So, uh, you know, if you know someone that could take advantage of that, please share this episode with them as well. So, Fiona, awesome. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Jim. Been great talking to you. Thank you for listening to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. If you want to hear more, join our mailing list at jimjimsreinventionrevolution.com. See you next time. And remember, the revolution has just begun. So dig in, embrace the process of reinvention, and start realizing the success you've always dreamed of. Hey, revolutionaries, if you enjoyed today's episode and today's guest, let them know by commenting on their Facebook page, finding their Twitter handle or Instagram feed, and letting them know you heard them on Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. And tell them what you got out of the episode, what you really liked, or how they inspired you. I know they would get a kick out of it, and it will help others find the same value that you found.